and presently general secretary of the indian physics association to tell us briefly about the activities of ipa and professor pandya's annual lecture series professor vandana nana thank you professor sajjad and uh, good evening and welcome to all of you all those in zoom as well as in youtube to this uh, pa pandya lecture 2021 and thank you to the special thanks to aligarh muslim university physics department for hosting this lecture just give me a couple of minutes to tell you uh, very briefly about uh, ipa and the uh, this lecture so i hope you can see my screen yes 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 let me just go to the screen sharing mode yeah so indian physics association was founded in 1970 so we just last year celebrated uh, 50 years of uh, indian physics association in this five decades it has played an important role in advancement and dissemination of the physics knowledge basic goal and of the uh, society is to actually provide a platform for the young researchers to interact acquaint young researchers of the developments in the field and this is achieved by publication of quarterly bulletin special reports books newsletters and holding special lectures there are series of lectures which ip ipa organizes the two main series are the dai cv raman lak lecture series there are five lectures every year there is the ipa uh, iop uk that is institute of physics uk baba uh, cockroft fault and exchange lectures these happen alternate years in india and in uk Uh, so pa pandya endowment lecture today's lecture is part of that series in addition ipa liaises with several international organizations like aps apps and iop uk other national bodies the science academies and so on. <coughs> so the uh, you can see this map the reach of ipa the, where there are oh, uh, several chapters distributed all throughout the uh, country and i think it also Shri gives Shri awards to young and senior scientists in recognition of their contribution to the field the more information about ipa can be found on the website of the ipa i will put this address also in the chat and this is a picture of one of the recent uh, quarterly bulletins of ipa which was brought out in the honor or in the memory of uh, the first woman particle physicist of the of india bibha choudhury and all the issues of uh, recent issues of physics news are available on the uh, physics news website ipa website the current office bearers of the ipa are professor ramkrishnan uh, president uh, who is a director of tifr vice president is professor tanushri sahadas gupta she is a director of sn bose center kolkata myself general secretary professor samit mandal from delhi university joint secretary dr aradhna shrivastava from brc is treasurer In 2017, IPA established a gender in physics working group to address the question of gender parity in physics profession, particularly in India. And Professor Shobhiti Goswami from PRL is currently the chair of IPA gender group. I am very happy that uh, Dr. Kanjilal, who was a former president of uh, IPA, is also in the audience today. The a brief word about Professor P. A. Pandya lecture. So P. A. Pandya was a mathematics graduate and a very passionate teacher. He has written a book on relativity in Gujarati. He has uh, was in, uh, involved with the uh, field of education in many many ways. So this annual lecture series is organized by I. P. A. with the help of generous endowment provided by late Professor S. P. Pandya, former director of uh, P. R. L. Ahmedabad, in honor of his late father, Professor P. A. Pandya. The lecture is delivered by eminent Indian physicists to give an exciting account of recent the recent developments in any area of physics, which will serve as a provide inspiration to young researchers and teachers. So we are very very happy to have a very large student audience today for today's lecture. And further, so before I stop, I just want to say, as many of you will know, that February 11 is declared by United Nations as International Day of Women and Girls in Science. and we are uh, in between this 11 february and 8th march which is international day of women so today we are really honored to have uh, one of the eminent women women physicists in the country 
and uh, i'm sure she will uh, her talk will not only introduce the subject but will also be an uh, will give an aspiration to many in the audience today so th thanks to both to speaker and the amu for organizing this talk thank you thank you very much uh, professor vandana now i request professor bp singh uh, to say a few words about the department and welcome uh, professor kajri majumdar uh, on his behalf and on the behalf of department and then i will introduce you are muted professor bp singh sorry sorry now can you hear me now yes okay so uh, so uh, professor uh, kajri majumdar and uh, professor vandana nanal professor dinkar kanjilal professor samit mandal professor sajad athar at the office bearers of ipa distinguished guests friends colleagues my dear students ladies and gentlemen at the very outset uh, on behalf of the physics department and also on my own behalf i once again welcome you all to this prestigious ipa professor p a pander lecture being or being organized on the online form at the physics department in collaboration with ipa Uh, now, I especially welcome the today's speaker, Professor Kajit Majumdar, an eminent physicist from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. I'm personally thankful that she has agreed to deliver the talk on the interesting topic, unbelievable pursuit for the unimaginable. I also welcome all the office bearers once again, and as I already mentioned, uh, Professor Vandana, Professor Samita, and others. In fact, we were planning to hold these lectures in association with. with ipa since a long time but you know that since due to covid 19 pandemic it had disturbed all the activities but the online mode is still continued and it had helped us to have still uh, nice interactions with each other before i hand over to the professor jadathar for detailed introduction of today's speaker it is my pleasant duty to tell you briefly that the physics department of amu aligarh was established way back in 1912 and in fact it was it was initially it was in 1908 it was combined department of uh, physics chemistry and in 1912 it became a separate department of physics and in fact the, the university was established in 1920 but the department is older than that of university in one sense and professor wali e mohammad in 1912 became the first head of the department at the time so the department is now almost like 121 years old and it is still an energetic department at present there are thirty, something like 35 faculty members in the department and more than 60 research scholars working in different areas of uh, physics like nuclear physics experimental nuclear physics uh, theoretical physics condensed matter physics spectroscopy and the nonlinear dynamics optical physics and all that so department has rich traditions of teaching research since its very inception and the first phd in physics was awarded in the year 1926 almost like 95 years back i spectroscopy lab was set up way back in 1930s at the cocker walton neutron generator was indigenously built in the university system in 1950s under the leadership of professor p s gill professor p r para singhal and professor h s hans in fact the department offers six semester undergraduate bsc honors courses four semester postgraduate msc courses the intake for undergraduate course program is 120 while for the postgraduate program the intake is 50 besides this the department also offers phd program in various fields of experimental and theoretical physics the department has got many national as well as international collaborations and it is also regularly funded through the ugc dst and de projects i would like to request all the researchers at amu especially the members of the physics department during this today's uh, uh, interaction to think think of reviving the aligarh chapter of ipa which i think is lying almost like dormant since long i myself is a life member of ipa and many of the colleagues are the members of ipa 
and they were participating in different activities of IPA. And I, I'm happy that Professor Vandana, Vandana and uh, Professor Samit have initiated the activities on the ban of IPA and they're continuing it in a, in a very nice way. And they have organized the program at AMU as well. And uh, let me just briefly tell you about uh, Professor Vandana Nadal also because uh, she's a very sincere and active member and uh, she's carrying out IP activities successfully. And uh, myself, as uh, for, for me, I can say that I know uh, Dr. Vandana since when we met for the first time, if you remember Vandana uh, in 1991 or so in SCRC school when we attended at uh, Northeastern Hill University, Nehu Shilong, the SCRC school we attended together. And the professor uh, Raghavir Singh was the research person or the, was the organizer of that program. And, and in fact, the professor Raghavir Singh is uh, was the alumni of this project department, MU Aligarh. Once again, I'm most grateful to your participation in this IPA Pandit lecture, PA Pandit lecture. And without taking too much of time, I, I once again welcome you all uh, to look forward to have an interesting talk by Professor Kajini Majumdar. Thank you so much. Now I want to hand over to Professor Sajjad Athar for the rest of the proceedings. Professor Thank you, Athar. Professor. Thank you, Professor B.P. Singh. Uh, now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Kaji Mozumdar uh, to the students. Uh, though all the senior faculty members and research scholars know her very well, uh, Professor Mazumdar is senior professor at the Department of High Energy Physics Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. She did uh, her PhD at, from TFR and University of Mumbai. She was a visiting scientist at University of Geneva, scientific associate at Experimental Physics Division, CERN. She was a spokesperson twice in, in India CMS collaboration during 2011, 13, and 2015 and 17. She was the chair of program advisory committee of SCRB on experimental high energy physics. She is involved with selection, various selection committee panel for appointments and promotion at several IITs and ICERs, member of expert panel of DST to review proposals in high energy physics. She is member of program advisory committee of DST, government of India to review proposals in high energy physics, nuclear physics, astrophysics. She is really workaholic and gem of a person. She took many responsibilities in CMS international collaboration, like member CMS international collaboration, co-chair physics office CMS collaboration, uh, member CMS thesis award committee, member CMS schools committee. And uh, really uh, she has done a lot of work, not only for in, in the field of particle physics, but in general for the community also. And it's a great honor and pleasure for us, for us to host uh, her today uh, in this IPA Pandya's lecture. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Kajri Mazumda, to deliver the talk. Thank you, Professor Rathar, for the kind introduction. Uh, actually, uh, I must uh, thank all of you to take your time uh, to come for this uh, lecture. So uh, thank you, Professor Kanjilal, one of the most senior and uh, very active uh, person, Professor uh, Mandana Nanal and Professor Samit Mandal, the General Secretaries of IPA. Professor B.P. Singh, Professor Saja Dattar for organizing uh, this talk. It's an honor to be considered to deliver this lecture. And of course, a good evening to all the respected distinguished guests, research scholars, students, and uh, friends. So let me get started. I will uh, share the screen. Maybe I will switch off the video so that it may be easier for the transmission. Adhuri, if you are no, you are in office, no bandwidth, then yeah. keep your video on. Okay, fine. Can you all uh, see this? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So I can get started. So looks like uh, I gave the title without um, looking at it second time. For me, I have been involved with the LHC experiment for a long time. So I missed the word LHC at the beginning. So I just said unbelievable pursuit for the unimaginable. But today I'm going to talk about the LHC experiment, the LHC project as such you can say. So if you look at the list of Nobel Prizes since it was instituted in 1901, almost 
of the physics Nobel prizes went directly to the fields of elementary particles or high energy physics. This underlines the rapid developments in theoretical as well as experimental fields, along with the advancement of technology. So first prize went to William Longin in 1901 for the discovery of X-rays in 1895. Of course, it recognized the importance of doing thorough experiments and interpreting the results correctly. We all know the story of the discovery of X-ray. And we also know that X-ray tube became a frequently used instrument in medicines afterwards, medical sciences. So some of the important epochs of modern physics, when I started listing, it was going on and on. So I just uh, remind uh, the younger generation of the things which has happened uh, more than uh, means long back, for example, say, well, of course, we talked about uh, extra discovery, then came radioactivity, discovery of electron by Thomson, atomic nucleus by Rutherford, isotopes, neutron, positron, whatever you call it, uh, muon, pion, antiproton, neutrinos. Then we come to this uh, current uh, decade that is uh, uh, current century. So we have Higgs boson in 2013 by uh, the Nobel Prize went to Professor Francois Englert and Peter W. Higgs. We will talk about it. And even in 2015, we had uh, Nobel Prize in Particle Physics, which was won by Kajita San and Evie McDonald for the discovery of the neutrino oscillations. So if you remember all, this is our rather for the scattering experiment in cartoon. So we all know that uh, here is a source and uh, rather for the shot uh, alpha particles to a gold foil. And uh, in a scintillating screen, the particles were recorded, which were coming out of the scattering. And in the right side, you can see that uh, most of the particles went through and through. Some of them got deflected uh, to a certain extent, but surprisingly, very few of them almost turned back. So large angle deviations were not only there and they turned back and it was interpreted correctly by Rutherford that there must be something very heavy at the center of the atom. And the electrons are, it's not a plum pudding type of model which earlier people used to have about the atom. So it's just atom is mostly empty and at the center lies the heavy nucleus which deflected the alpha particles. So we start typically our nuclear physics um, course uh, with uh, such experiment, studying about such experiments. But I would like to quote uh, somebody famous, uh, Feynman uh, Dyson, about the advancement of science. So what he says is that new directions in science are launched by new tools much more often than by new concepts. The effect of concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in new ways, but the effect of a tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that has to be explained. So the discovery of Higgs boson particle in 2012 is another triumph of human intellect. And here, of course, the concept was there, but uh, really great effort was uh, made in terms of techniques to have it, to prove that uh, hypothesis that yes, there is a Higgs boson. Of course, this happened in parallel to big developments on the theory side. So on the physics, we, of course, were very lucky from the beginning of uh, 20th century, we kept on having a big milestone uh, uh, of, uh, what should I say, development, special relativity, general relativity, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and uh, later in 60s standard model of particle physics. And then on the mathematical sides, of course, we had essential tools, that's why the fields uh, develop, the calculus, complex numbers, complex functions, differential geometry, group theory, Hermitian operator, silver space. And these have, of course, become our you know, textbook uh, topics. We all study them and to learn about um, modern physics and uh, particle physics in particular. So where has it led us to? Or we can also question, what are we up to? What are we up to? We are actually searching for the genetic code of the universe. So this is a famous sculpture by a French artist called Radha. And this is Homo sapiens, the thinking man. So we are always, mankind is always questioning. And the questions we ask here is the, what is the working principle of the universe? How did it begin? How will it evolve in the future? What are the fundamental building blocks of forces and forces of the universe? Now, the last question actually, the fundamental building blocks that the definition of itself kept on changing as we progressed in science. It started with the Greek philosophers, the sages in our country about what are the most 
um, basic level ingredients of the universe and we kept on changing and of course we know the mendeleev's periodic table etc all those things uh, we have passed through and uh, to answer these questions we can just say we have passed through but there have been great developments great minds interpreted the facts sometimes they were disturbing facts and but they could think and interpret it correctly for example let's say experiment showed that the light traveled on nothing that is the michelson moldy experiment i am referring to but it was not expected but it was einstein who could realize that there is no absolute reference frame for motion in the universe the speed of light must be the same in all reference frames and of course we got relativity and the rest of the development in physics we all know now let us look at our universe so we are um, now almost 14 billion years away from the beginning of the universe which we think started with the big bang so we are at this age and we have uh, come uh, through many many evolutions some of the um, big ideas which have gone on explaining how the uh, universe evolved are uh, say for example we had inflation we had quantum fluctuations at the beginning we had inflation then we have uh, seen this afterglow light pattern almost 400 uh, thousand years from the big bang away and then we have dark ages and various things so today we are seeing the stars and galaxies etc so mind you for the time before 400 thousand years we don't have direct detection capability because the photons are not there we can't see the photons earlier than this so to understand the physics beyond this time we have to really interpret various phenomena and guess things and then we have to prove in experiments so lhc allows to test the physical laws describing the universe at an epoch of almost 1 picosecond after the big bang 1 picosecond we are talking about billion years and you can imagine how small this is 1 picosecond to 1 microsecond is the lhc time scale the physics it describes for the, this we have large scale tools we have of course the satellite borne experiments we have radio telescopes and we have various uh, big um, instruments which are looking at the large structures in the universe and at the lhc we are looking at the microstructure of matter and you can see here to just to set the scale we think that the universe the expanse of the universe can in, is of the order of 10 to the power 28 cm radius of the galaxy is 10 to the 22 earth to sun's distance is 10 to the 13 radius to earth is 10 to the 8 and so on and of course you know about the measurement of atom and proton etc and lhc is proving matter at a distance scale of 10 to the power minus 18 meter so basically it's a super microscope it studies the physical laws of first moments after the big bang and it increases the symbiosis between the particle physics astrophysics and cosmology on a clear night moonless night we can see our akashganga the milky way galaxy and if we look from the distance we can see our pale blue dot we are here so there are about 10 to the power 12 galaxies in the universe that's what the astrophysicist estimate and each contains on an average about 10 to the power 11 stars now if we consider their constituents there are about 10 to the power 80 quarks i am coming to it soon so all are essentially made up of the same elements of matter formed in the earliest moments so this is really mind boggling that our universe has so many large so such a large number 10 to the power 80 quarks but essentially they are of same element what we are seeing on earth and what we see in the universe across so of course these pictures are uh, need not be explained to you of the protons the constituents we know as of today it consists of three types of quarks uh, two types of quarks three quarks in number two up type one down type and there are gluons as well so how do we do experiments in particle physics so basic idea is that due to heisenberg's uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics to observe phenomena occurring at a length scale of lambda we need a high energy probe which should be of momentum greater than h by lambda so larger is the energy of the probe 
finite details of structure of matter can be studied. So from this relation, it is evident. So equivalently, we can say larger the energy, energy density available in the laboratory, we can probe science closer to the beginning of the universe. That is what we are trying at the LHC. Let's take the LHC energy is about 10 TeV. It is colliding protons at a center of mass energy of 13 TeV at present. And, uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, if we consider 10 TeV, we can see that LHC can probe structure of quarks and leptons up to 10 TeV or minus 18 meter. That's what I had referred to earlier. Note also, the available energy in the laboratory can momentarily produce an unstable heavy particle of mass m given by E by C square or a pair with a mass E by 2. Of course, provided such particle had existed any time in nature, then only it will show up, otherwise not. We can think of some particle, some exotic particles which we have not seen till now, but uh, we may postulate that no, no, it existed. But if nature never had it, so even if we make the situation congenial for production of such a particle, it will not be produced. And what type of energy scales we are talking about? Of course, we know that uh, electron, I, uh, we can uh, just uh, say that uh, we take the mass of the proton as one GV, that means so one giga electron volt. Electron is uh, 2000 times lighter than that. And what is electron volt is a very tiny amount. 10 to the 1.6 into 10 to the power 19, minus 19 joules. So how high should be the high energy? Essentially, oh, I'm sorry. The mass should be much lower than the energy of it. So motion of an air atom, let's say room temperature, is about 40 milli electron volt. Chemical reactions are occurring at the few electron volt level. And so the, we, of course, know the, to remove an electron from an atom, we need about 10 electron volt. Nuclear reactions are occurring. Per atom, you can say the energy involved is 1 MeV. So to remove a proton from a nucleus, we need about 10 MeV. So we have the electrons, the experiments, they are generating energies of this order. Rest energy, I just now mentioned, it's about 1 GV, 1 giga electron volt. And each proton in the LH, at the LHCB beam, in the LHC beam, they have energy of 6.5 T, that means 6.5 into 10 to the power 12 electron volt. So if you remember the here, is still tiny, almost uh, equivalent to the kinetic energy of a flying mosquito, but in uh, our units, electron volt unit, it sounds quite large. And it potentially proves a distance scale of 10 to the minus 18 meter. So to answer the big questions, what we need is that we need to study particle interactions at the highest energies point of view. And technology drives this progress. So to have LHC beams of such high energy, we dependent on the advancement of technology. Then only we could have this LHC machine working. And finally, we had the Higgs particle discovered. So going further, of course, we know under the optical microscope, which has a wavelength, say, for example, 5 into 10 to the power minus 7 meter, we are able to probe up to 10 micron. And under electron microscope, where the kinetic energy of the order of one electron volt, we go up to 10 to the power minus 9 meter. So similarly, of course, we have been seeing to see the quarks, to probe the quarks, the structure, we need the probe kinetic energy should be about 100 G. And this is what LHC is providing us, 100 GV or more. And then we can probe the quarks at a distance scale of 10 to the power minus 17 minus 18 meter. Doing all this, we have come up to certain level of understanding about how the physical world works in the universe. So the universe consists of very few types of elementary particles. I'll soon introduce them here. And their interactions can be explained in terms of few forces which occur due to exchange of carrier particles. Let's take electron and photon. So electrons are one type of particles, spin half particles. And uh, they interact via photon, the mediator of the electromagnetic interaction. So we know that electromagnetic interaction basically defines what all we have seen in atomic physics, molecular physics, optics, electronics, telecommunications, all are very important uh, branches. And the propagation of electromagnetic field, the, it, it follows the inverse square law. 
for gravity again is uh, every day we, we encounter it so it uh, it has to deal in our everyday life with uh, falling objects planets uh, terrestrial uh, orbits stars galaxies the movements etc again they it follows inverse square law and coming to the mediator for the gravitational interaction we have not yet seen this particle we call it graviton it is supposed to have spin 2 photon has spin 1 and now come to the central two blocks we have weak interaction if you remember the beta decay in nuclear physics there we have seen when the neutron uh, transforms into proton basically it is going to neutron is transformed to proton an electron and an antineutrino. So we observe only the electron, we call it beta decay, and then we have the solar fusion. All this is driven by the weak interaction. And the mediator of weak interaction, actually, it's very short range. That is why we don't see them, we don't uh, feel them in the everyday life. And there are actually three mediators. The two are charged, W plus and W minus, don't bother about the name. And another is neutral, called set zero. Coming to strong interaction, which is at the core of the nucleus holding the uh, quarks together. So we have, again, short range interaction. And there are eight gluons which are mediating this strong force. If we come to the list of elementary particles, though I said few, truly speaking, there are uh, few particles which are stable. Most of them are unstable in this table. They decay because there are lower massive uh, particles are available. So we have uh, for the constituents of the neutrons and protons, we have up and down quarks. In everyday life, we also encounter electron. Neutrinos, of course, we do not feel, but they are there. But if you can uh, say uh, the how these are organized, so we have uh, strongly interacting particles called quarks, and then we have the leptons, which do not take part in strong interaction. So these are in green, the leptons. And there are first generation, second generation, third generation. And if you can uh, look at it, the top part is as massive as 173 GeV, means 173 times heavier than the proton. And the lightest one is the uptight quark, 2.3 MeV. That is among the quarks. Similarly, on the lepton side, of course, neutrinos are many orders of magnitude lower than the other particles. And then we have the mediators of forces, the gauge bosons, we call it. These are um, W, Z, photon, these are all spin one particles. And uh, they, we have uh, photon and also gluon here, the, and the gluon, of course. These are the, the gluons are the mediator of the strong force. And a singleton is the Higgs particle. It's really a unique type of particle, not seen before, not like the other particles listed here. And in this list, we have the charges and the um, spins, etc. Mind you, all these, and various other quantum numbers are to be measured experimentally. Now, if you consider the electromagnetic interaction, for example, say, if we have two charges, Q1 and Q2, a distance r apart, we can find the potential. But these charges are the inputs. Same thing for the gravitational interaction. We, have, we need to give the masses, then only we know the gravitational interaction between these two massive particles, M1 and M2, let's say. So there are inputs to be given, and then we know the theory we have constructed about gravitational interaction, about the electromagnetic interaction, how the results of our experiments will be. So that is dictated by the theoretical construction. But we need inputs. So that's why I said for all these elementary particles, various attributes are to be measured, are to be determined experimentally. And I have already mentioned about the Higgs boson. It does not have any spin. You can see here zero. It does not have any electromagnetic charge. It is 125 more massive times massive more massive than the proton though i was referring to as higgs particle only we should uh, give respect to all the people who have been involved in postulating this particle and so we have started calling it braut engler higgs boson so three people together actually uh, almost within a short span of time there were three groups totally six people involved Higgs was alone. In one group, there are two people, and in another group, there are three people who sort of postulated this type of particle. And you can see here, the Higgs interacts with, you can see all the particles are connected with Higgs. 
through these uh, blue lines. So it interacts with everybody. And uh, the effect of this interaction is that it provides the mass. So your Higgs boson plays a central role in the mass generation of all the fundamental particles. And the masses you have seen there in the last slide, but if we put them, of course, as we know that neutrinos are very, very less massive compared to all other particles. Among the other particles, we have the electron and the heaviest particle is the top part. And uh, this is 173. Higgs particle is about 125 times. Wz are about 80 and 91 times heavy, as heavier than the proton. And then we have the other quarks. Now you can ask why the Higgs, okay, yes, it is one of the particles in this table, but why the discovery of the Higgs boson was so important. To really see that, we have to little bit uh, take a holistic view. Holistic view in the sense, we know how we utilize symmetry in our various uh, interpretation of the physics. We just uh, take it for granted. Actually, be it uh, our uh, various uh, uh, mathematical constructs, there are symmetries involved in it, but uh, we didn't pay attention earlier. But we have started to appreciate the symmetry by first starting to appreciate the symmetry in nature and how the symmetry in nature has been applied in various artworks and various physical systems that has helped in the theoretical description of the physical systems. So the symmetry of a physical system can be identified as a physical or a mathematical feature which is preserved under some change. Say, for example, temperature in a room. So we we'll measure it in one corner or the other corner, it will be the same. So we refer to as translational symmetry. If we just take a mathematical expression like this, a square C plus 3AB plus B square C, then you can see that A and B are interchangeable. So this type of uh, um, symmetry helped us always in physics. But remember also that symmetry also has practical advantages. Position of the eyes on the face, pivot in the balance, all these are helped us practically. We cannot measure the distance properly unless we have the eyes symmetrically placed. Now, of course, there is symmetry, which is there. But when we started understanding that, yes, the mathematical description of the elementary particles and their uh, interactions, the theoretical description, that also is uh, dependent on such symmetry concepts. And based on that, what was developed, we call it standard model of particle physics. I already introduced you the spin one bosons, the force carriers, the gluons, the WZ particles, and the photons. And there are other types of symmetries which have gone into constructing the mathematical model. But uh, one uh, important symmetry consideration was that the carriers have to be massless. And we have encountered this, that the photon is massless, we have infinite range. But we also mentioned that our uh, weak force, nuclear force, etc., they are actually of small range. So if we take the weak interaction, there are carriers W plus minus and the Z. So the limited range of this weak interaction implied that they are massive. At least that is what we measure. We measure in the sense that is what we perceive that WZ must be massive because their ranges are limited. So what does it mean? That if we apply the same mathematical uh, structure like uh, quantum electrodynamics, which has been extremely successful in describing the, all the electromagnetic interactions to date, we, get we got enthusiastic about it and tried to explain similarly the weak interaction. And in that weak interaction mathematical structure, we have to then make the W and Z particles, the carriers, to be massless like it is in photon. But if we do that, we cannot, uh, what should I say? We cannot compare the results with what we see in the experiments. So the results indicate that WZ particles are massive. That means somehow the symmetry between the electromagnetic interaction and the weak interaction is broken. So how did it happen? Nobody is to be blamed. It happened spontaneously. So what happened is that in early universe at high temperature, the system was in a different ground state in which the symmetry was explicit. But in today's cooler universe, the ground state of the symmetry is not explicit, not explicit. So if you think about, let's say, ferromagnet. So ferromagnet, when you consider it at room temperature, of course, if you put in a magnetic field, all the spins will be in a 
oriented in a particular direction. But if we heat it above the Curie temperature, then you know ferromagnet loses its property. The spins are all randomly oriented. So there is no particular direction which is to be preferred. So that was a more symmetric phase. And the symmetry was broken when we cool the ferromagnet. And we see all the spins are aligned in a particular direction. So similar situation is happening here. Okay, fine, we tried to understand this way that, okay, when it was high energy, there was symmetry existing, but in a lower energy, that symmetry got spoiled. And that is what we are seeing that, of course, we know universe was much more hotter at the early phase. It is continuously cooling and now we are quite cold. So that's why we have lost the symmetry. But that was not enough. Theory also predicted that there has to be an additional particle, which we have not thought about, which we have not realized that it can play any role. That is the relic of this symmetry breaking, that is a spin zero boson. And that's what we call bright uh, BEH boson, Braut, Engler, and Higgs boson. And uh, to this idea, is there, it's very nice theoretically, but we cannot take it. Physics is an experimental uh, subject and it has to be experimentally proved. So that's why experimental discovery of this particle was essential to complete the description as envisaged theoretically. So it became very uh, crucial to establish the existence of uh, Higgs boson, if at all nature had it any time after 19, uh, late 1980s, you can say, when in the lab experiment, we could uh, measure the properties of W and Z particles and all other properties as predicted by the weak interaction theory. So if all other uh, predictions are matching with the experiment, then this prediction also must be matching. Or if not, then this whole theoretical uh, construction may be wrong. So it became a bit uh, sort of, uh, you can say embarrassing situation that all aspects of standard model was uh, being uh, proved to be correct, but uh, how the particles got masses that was yet to be established. And then came LHC. And uh, we were lucky enough, LHC started operation in 2009. And uh, with uh, two, three years of data taking, we had the discovery of the Higgs, you know, Higgs boson. And uh, these are computer reconstruction uh, images of when the two particles uh, collided, what happened is the Higgs boson uh, was created tangently, and then it decayed. In this case, it decayed to two photons, high energy photons. And in another time, the six person was created, but it went to decay to two Z particles and these Z particles decayed to electrons or muon pair. So when we mean the make the invariant mass, so we get the mass equivalent to the X boson system, we get this peak. If we don't have this peak, then we will not be able to establish the existence of X boson. That X boson was created in the LHC experiments. We have already proved in experiments, in LEP, LEP experiments and earlier part of uh, LHC experiments, that yes, this is due to the Z boson. Its mass is 91 GV. And when we make the invariant mass, we can see this is happening. So this way we can, if we do not have this pink uh, uh, shaded um, histogram, you can see that there was data and we could not uh, be, uh, describe the behavior of the data. So that's why Higgs boson was established by showing such description of the data. So this was the culmination of efforts for about 10,000 experimental scientists and engineers for a few decades. I will give you when does the LHC effort started. And we are fortunate enough, we are proud enough that India participates in CMS experiments. Of course, India also participates in another uh, LHC experiment that is called ALICE, which looks at the coagulant plasma, but I'm not talking about it today. You have all seen pictures of LHC accelerators, so I'm not uh, going to talk about it. So coming back to the Higgs was on a discovery next year in 2013, Higgs and Engler was uh, given the Nobel prize. And the citation says for the theoretical discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our, to our understanding of the origin of mass of subatomic particles, and which recently was confirmed through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle by the Atlas and CMS experiments at Sun's Large Hadron Collider. And that is what I was trying to explain to you. So coming more about these experiments, first I have to start with the LHC machine. So it was conceived, conceived in 1980s. So think at, about it. In 2012, we discovered the Higgs boson. But the idea started in 1980s 
LAC construction started in 1998. In fact, India was one of the first countries to provide support or to commit support for the LAC project. And there are big magnets, very, it, this is the one I tried to tell that he, it is uh, based on the state of the technology, magnet technology, superconducting uh, uh, cavities are there. And uh, the magnets were uh, made uh, in various parts of the world. Then they were brought into CERN and uh, testings were done on the surface. Again, Indian engineers uh, played crucial role for that. And finally, they were pushed under the, on the, uh, in the tunnel, which is about 100 to 50 meter underground. So from top, you cannot say, make out about the existence of the LAC tunnel. And first proton-proton collisions took place two years after 2009. High energy collisions were in 2010, and we have this thing set. But mind you, this LHC is not going to stop. We have already uh, uh, completed uh, 10 years of LHC, more than 10 years, but it will operate for two more decades. So it will go on till almost uh, mid, if not early, uh, early or mid 2040s. So LHC is here to stay and it is for you younger generation. And when it comes to the theoretical uh, uh, idea, which was postulated in 1965, as I told you by Higgs et al. And the Nobel Prize uh, we got in 2013, rather they got it in 2013. So we had this uh, prize uh, for, called the Fundamental Physics Prize that was backed by these two experiments. And uh, it reminds uh, me of uh, what Abraham Lincoln once said, give me six hours to cut a tree and I shall use the first four sharpening the excel. That means that we, if we make the tool very good, then we shall be able to do the job well. That's what proves these timelines. And that's what I tried to allude to earlier. So instrumentation is the enabler of science, both pure and applied. And for that, the seeds have to be sown long before the actual experiment, that's what. So seeds were sown in 1980s and we got the this particle in 2012. And so we are uh, uh, nurturing uh, such seeds and we are nurturing the LHC project very well. We are thankful to our funding agencies, Department of Atomic Energy, Department of Science and Technology, so that uh, Indian scientists can take part and the students are doing very well in these LHC experiments because it is for next two decades. So this is the big ambitious tool. This is the accelerator. You must have already seen uh, such a picture uh, many times before. So why it is special uh, tool? Because it needs very high fluxes of colliding beams and state of the technology for the superconducting magnets. And it uh, required some 10, 12 years of R&D. Accessible energy in the laboratory. How do we get it? If we look into basically simple mathematics, here let's say two protons are colliding. They have uh, energy and momentum almost equivalent because their energy is 6,500 times the mass of the proton. So it is uh, proton mass can be neglected. If we do that, then we see that at the center of mass system, the energy is almost twice the beam energy. And so when uh, protons of uh, 6,500 uh, GeV collides, we get 1,300 GeV center of mass energy. But had we kept one proton at rest, that means this momentum is uh, zero, and we just hit with another proton, then our center of mass energy actually, what we get actually is not, less, is not much. So we will, if we have a beam, we have made uh, very uh, good, excellent magnets, and we use only one beam, to collide uh, one side of the protons and keep the other side the proton stable or rather uh, fixed in one place, then it's like a fixed target experiment, then the available energy will be very less and that will not do. So strategy of particle acceleration, you all know. If we look at the linear um, uh, accelerator, then what we have is that there is a uh, uh, alternate only uh, this uh, magnet, the polarity is changing. So at the exit, uh, at the entrance time, the particle is feeling accelerated and uh, rather attracted. And by the time it exists, there is a deflection and then it enters the next one. So continuously, this length is increasing. And if we increase the same setup, what we use is that we repeatedly accelerate the charged particles using the high voltage and bend the path using the magnets. So we have various deflecting magnets, we have focusing magnets, then we have RF cavities because of the bent of the charged particles, there is synchrotron radiation and the uh, lost radio energy has to be replenished. And this is the basic structure of circular accelerators. And how the high power magnets are necessary because it goes the magnetic field is uh, decided by the energy of the beam we want and the physical size of the accelerator, the radius of the accelerator. 
The dipole magnets at the LHC provide 8.3 Tesla of magnetic field and it operates at almost zero temperature, absolute zero, less than two Kelvin. And of course, we have synchrotron radiation. So what happens at the LHC? When you are saying that we are colliding protons, actually we are colliding bunches of protons and they are not continuous. These are trains of uh, proton bunches. And in each of uh, the uh, bunch, there are almost 10 to the power 11 protons. When the protons are colliding, actually most of them are just having elastic, elastic collision. Once in a while, there is highly inelastic collision. That means the co constituents of the protons become free because the very high elasticity means there is large amount of momentum exchange. So at high energies, the constituents of protons become free and then they interact, uh, they can interact in different ways, electromagnetic interaction, strong interaction, weak interaction. And depending on the type of interaction they are undergoing, we will see different types of final state particles. Once in a while, there will be Higgs. And the possibility, the probability for Higgs production is only one in 10 to the 13 events, when we can detect the Higgs decaying to Z particles and these Z particles can decay to electrons and positron pairs. And this is just a computer reconstruction of one of the events. What are all these yellow streaks? These yellow streaks are that when these protons are colliding, there are more than one pair of strongly interacting particles, quarks and gluons. So they all have a strong interaction and those hadronic interaction produces a lot of low energy ions essentially. And the pair of protons which are uh, interacting with very high energy to give me the Higgs particle, they will then produce say, for example, uh, energy deposits I'll come to it. This is given by the red uh, blocks. So this is what is explained here. So now, when we, if we look at the invariant mass, say for example, in the previous picture, these uh, four electrons, and we try to uh, see the frequency distribution of the invariant mass of the four electron system, it will be a falling spectrum if there is no particle at some mass value. If we see that above a falling spectrum, there is a excess, then we can see, yes, there is a resonance particle and particle of so and so mass has been produced and that has decayed to the four electrons. And uh, going by such interpretation, we try to understand, yes, in the LHC collisions, there was a particle of so-and-so mass was produced momentarily, and then it decayed to finally to so-and-so, in this case, let's say four electrons. And so electrons are the particles which we can measure, whose momentum and energy we can measure, and we constructed the invariant mass. So the actual interactions for a given proton-proton collision takes place among the constituents, each carrying a fraction of the incident beam energy. And this fraction cannot be controlled because we are controlling the whole uh, body of the proton. So the amount of energy in each collision will be different. So that is why this invariant mass will have different values in different collisions. And that's why we call the hadron colliders and broadband machines. And we have access to a wide range of subprocess energy. The point is, as I mentioned, the masses of the particles have to be determined experimentally. So for the Higgs particle, similarly, we did not know the mass. So it could be anything from, let's say, 100 GeV to 700 GeV. The theory could not specify, though there was some indication that it will be lower than 250 GeV. But since the theory in principle allows up to 700 GeV, 700, 800 GeV, we should have provision to produce this Higgs particle, even if it is a mass of, say, 650 GeV. And by colliding protons, of very high energy, because of this fractional energy coming for each particular collision, we were in a position to produce a particle which can have mass 5 GV, 10 GV, 100 GV. We were, of course, knowing that it should be above 100 GV to up to 750 GV. And what we got is about 125 GV. I will come to that. So various interactions occur for a given energy, and we have to carefully do the analysis of the data we collect. And what I am trying to is, uh, impress upon here is that LHC is capable, capable of producing new particles over a wide mass range, up to few TV almost, because its center of mass energy is 13 TV. And even if we consider that once in a while, this fraction X is very large, so it can produce particles up to one, two TV. And how do we do the experiments? We have to put a detector. 
So this is a picture of the real detector. The um, proton beam lines go head on, uh, here at the center. It's uh, out of this uh, screen, you can say, uh, and into the skin, this uh, screen. And like onion shell, there are various layers of detectors. They are supposed to, each layer is supposed to dedicated for doing a particular type of uh, particle detection. I'm not uh, reading all these details, but it's a very complex detector. It's about 15 meter in height, about 30 meter in length along the beam line, you can say. It's like a cylinder. It's a, but it's a huge granular detector with 100 million electronics readout channel. And it collects information in real time. Every 25 nanosecond, proton bunches are colliding at LHC and the front end readout electronics are ready to take data. So 100 million electronics readout defines, you can say, the complexity. And uh, the time scale involved also is really makes the things very challenging. And uh, this detector was initially built in parts in granular form in different parts of the world. Then they were uh, put together and then they were assembled one after the other, all on surface, other than one particular uh, portion. There's the most central portion consisting of the silicon detectors. And then it was lowered 150 meter. I told you that LAC accelerator is 150 meter below the surface. So it was lowered with a 23 hour operation. Special crane, only uh, one such crane in the whole world exists. And it was brought down very slowly. So it is designed, built, operated, maintained, and periodically improved by international community, including India, under close scrutiny. So we are taking part in all aspects of this LHC CMS experiment. The main strategy for designing the detectors is quite a lot. I will just give the salient features. So basic idea is that I told you a few slides back that the probability for a Higgs boson to be produced in proton-protein interaction is very, very low. So what do we do is that I mentioned about the high intensity LHC collision. So not only high energy, the protons are collided many, many times. So that the, even if the probability is low, we have in a reasonable amount of time, a certain handful of the rare processes like Higgs production. So at LHC, 1 billion per second, the interactions are taking place at this rate. And we record only the most interesting one because we just cannot record all the information coming every 25 nanosecond from 100 million channels in a detector. So we throw away a lot of uh, so-called uh, information about the collision and we take what we consider most interesting ones. So a lot of high-end sophisticated electronics save the day, like the high-end FPGAs, state-of-the-art FPGAs. So there we I'm referring to the trigger. And the trigger is the online selection in real time. And then it goes for offline analysis, which uh, say, for example, research scholars uh, analyze the data over three to four years and uh, to produce a PhD, to produce a paper, and so on and so forth. So what we want to do is that where the protons are colliding, we want to cover up completely. We don't, because... From this interaction point, the particles are emanating. We don't want to leave any of them. We don't want to miss them because then our interpretation about the whole collision will be wrong. And uh, we expect about 1,000 charged particles in certain collisions. Not all, but in certain collisions. So their energy momentum are to be measured well. That means the whole situation is quite crowded. So we want to measure the position and, and, and energy momentum of the particles very accurately. We don't want to make mistakes. And we don't want to have overlying uh, uh, particles, means overlapping particles. For that, magnet for the CMS detector plays important role because through that, we bend the path of the charged particles using the magnetic field. And the lever arm of the magnetic uh, field, this is the L, you can say, that determines how good the resolution is. L is large, means the resolution sigma will be small. And that is important for us. Then only we can measure the momentum very well. So the detector size increases with radial distance. At the innermost uh, layer, we have the pixel trackers, the tracking detector, the pixel components. They are is about 10 micron or so. And uh, later we have the calorimeters, the electromagnetic calorimeters. Uh, the front end is about uh, two centimeter plus two centimeter crystals. At the back end, they're three centimeter into three centimeter. And then we have the muon detectors, which are several meters long. So 
All this puts very high demand on the data storage, as I mentioned already. So average event size is about 2 MB. So multi-messenger tools of, uh, let's see, one of them is about the electromagnetic interaction. Say, for example, we can, of course, detect particles of certain type, which we know how they will interact with the matter we put in the detector. That is photon, electron, positron, muon, pion, proton, neutron, kion, etc. And all these particles have, they are either stable or they have long lifetime. If they have shorter lifetime, they will decay and they will decay to one of these particles or some of these particles and we measure that and then we reconstruct back like a uh, detector, uh, like a detective, you can say. And of course, we cannot uh, detect the neutrinos or neutrino-like particles which do not interact with the matter. So the production of heavy particles have to be interpreted from the decay products. Say, for example, energy loss in a detector via electromagnetic interaction is how is it interpreted? We make the particle, say for example, photon, impinge a high Z material. So one means it impinges the high Z material. In the nuclear field, it uh, now uh, becomes electron positron pair, pair creation. Then they can again emit a photon through um, brain stalling process and the electron can go on with a lower energy. So this process will continue. And slowly, the energy of the particles, the electron positron and the photon will be so small that there is uh, no more production of new electron positron pair. And uh, this is how the, in the detector, we see how the shear, um, how the shower has developed. And similarly for the um, other type of matter, say for example, pion or the protons, we make them lose their energy while interacting via strong interaction. And uh, so again, it's a similar way it happens. And uh, we try to measure how much energy it started with. So for that, of course, we have to calibrate. And uh, then we, from there, we measure, the, we interpret about the energy momentum. So if we take a slice of the CMS detector, you can say we have the silicon detectors that records the passage of charged particles. If it is a photon, it will not record the passage of the photon. But in the electromagnetic calorimeter, it will produce a shower. If it's an electron, of course, this is the red line. It is bent because it's immersed, the whole detector is immersed in a magnetic field. And then it is followed by loss of energy by the electromagnetic um, interaction. This is uh, due to the electron. So the moment we see large amount of energy deposit in the electromagnetic uh, calorimeter followed by a charged particle track, we know it is a, an electron. If there is no track detected, that means it's a photon. Similarly, for the pion, proton, neutron, etc. And again, for proton or the pion, there will be a track and which is bent, depending on the charge of the particle. We know the magnetic field direction. Muon is heavier by 200 times compared to the electron. And uh, it is, again, not having much radiation because it is uh, heavier. Its uh, probability for brain is very low. And uh, it, uh, it does not have a strong interaction. So it manages to lose very small amount of energy. And because it comes out from the interaction point with high energy, it manages to pass through all portions of the inner portion of the detector. And the magnetic field, the return you, basically the field direction gets reversed. And that's why you see a wavy line. The muon, which was bent this side, when the magnetic field in one direction, and then the on the return yoke, which is by soft iron, we are instrumented with uh, basically drift chambers. So we measure the position of the passage of the muon through this, and then we reconstruct this using the computer. I just uh, want to mention a little bit about the silicon detectors. So semiconductor detectors, basically energy loss by ionization, and it produces electron hole pairs, and the charges move in electrical field, producing DC current in external circuit in reverse uh, bias diagram. So signals from highly precise electrodes are used for position measurement. This is the important part for our uh, talk today. So these are position sensitive detectors and we can measure the position of the particles very well. And in the inner portion, of course, a lot of particles are coming out and it's very dense. So unless we have good resolution, we cannot measure the energy momentum properly. And of course, there are many uses in high energy physics, nuclear physics, astrophysics, synchrotron, medical images, and not to mention about your smartphone. So this is what happens. You can see here, the electron hole pairs are there, and then you can reconstruct the passage of the particle. 
And how did we detect the um, uh, Higgs particle in 2012? We mentioned that Higgs decays to two photons, or it can decay, it could uh, decay to to Z particles, which were decaying to electrons or the muon pair, basically four leptons, and we reconstructed their invariant mass. So here I'm showing the picture of invariant mass of two photons, highly energetic photons, which are supposed to be having properties, kinematic properties, similar to what we expect for the Higgs boson to decay to photons. Now the decay branching ratio is very, very small. And uh, there are, of course, many other processes happening in, at the LHC where we will get two photons in the event having similar properties. But the invariant mass is a very nice variable. And it will show that if the photons are coming from arbitrary sources, it will be a falling spectrum. Higher the invariant mass, the number of events will, will be lower. But in addition to this so-called background, in case there is a new particle, new resonance produced here in this case of a mass 125 GB, this photon invariant mass spectrum will have excess of events around that value. And this is what happened. And this is what is interpreted that yes, Higgs boson was produced, Higgs boson mass was 125 GB because we are seeing a resonance structure here. And this is what we see. So how many uh, are due to uh, Higgs uh, particle production? For that, we we we'll say, for example, we fit this smooth background from the side portions. We then interpret what is the actual data C minus the expected background falling by uh, counting by this curve. And the rest of it, this is the yellow portion, is due to the Higgs boson particle. And uh, you can uh, just to give you the example, or rather, how the invariant mass is formed, you measure the energy of the two photons, but that's not enough. The angle between the two photons is also important. And again, to measure the angle, you can imagine now which way the direction, in which direction the photons have gone, it is very important to know. And uh, so that is why we need to have very, uh, what should I say, very precise measurement of the position of the shower position and the entrance, the uh, angle of entry of the photons into the crystal phase. Because as I explained earlier, the photons passage cannot be detected in the silicon detector. So almost 80,000 lead tungsten crystals are there in the CMS detector, each of length 23 centimeter, front face is 2.2 into 2.2 centimeter, as I mentioned, and it covers the central region of the CMS detector. But as this picture shows, it is mainly lead tungsten. It's extremely heavy, but it's transparent. And its response time is very only a few nanoseconds. So that's why it is good to measure these high energy photons and in principle be ready every 25 nanoseconds. So of course, a lot of uh, detector R&D has gone in to making this electromagnetic calorimeter in the CMS detector, which was crucial for discovering this Higgs particle via Higgs 2 for di photon decay. And we were fortunate enough. So in late 80s and early 90s, we were cutting out some of these detector R&D at TIFR. We were exposing them to BRC radiation facilities, and we were measuring how due to radiation, the crystal performance will degrade. And all these ideas have also gone in deciding finally the properties of the crystal calorimeter we will have put into the CMS detector. I want to mention about one more aspect. This is about the data deluge. So total number of electronics channel, as I mentioned, is 10 to the actually nine. They are ready to take data every 25 nanosecond. That means per year, per experiment, we need about 10 petabytes of data. <coughs> petabytes is a very huge amount of data. And from World Wide Web, it was just a natural evolution to go to the worldwide distributed computing. So what happens is not only information sharing, it's the computing itself, it gets shared. And the computing servers, they are spread all around in uh, some universities or uh, some centers, research centers all across the world, different uh, groups are providing various computing uh, facilities and all are integrated together. And in real time, the data is being shared, computation is being shared, and all this is being monitored also real time. That is important in 24, 7, 365 days. How is it possible? Because the large area network speed became comparable to the speed of the compute processors. So earlier we thought my data should be sitting in my computer. That was not necessary because across long distance, 
we could now exchange data and still compute in a different compute server, sitting in a different location. So that is the main idea about the grid computer. And fortunately enough, again, due to our funding agencies, our government, that we have a grid computing center. In fact, this is uh, this enables the Indian scientists to take part in the data analysis crucial. And it is uh, operational before the start of the LEC experiments. So I have to come to an end because I've already taken too much time. So almost 10 years after the discovery of the Higgs boson and many more studies confirm that the theoretical description, the standard model of particle physics at the LHC energies. So we do expect that beyond the standard model, there will be some other interesting physics, which uh, we shall be able to, we may be able to test at LHC, but uh, that will uh, not be described by the standard model. So this justification for existence of interesting physics beyond LHC energies, LHC energies you can imagine about few hundred GV to one to TV. It is not described by standard model, but we strongly believe that it still holds. And uh, LHC is going uh, to live for two more decades. So with a lot more data, we shall be able to probe those physics. So there is very high hopes and it will really become fruitful. So full potential of LHC must be extracted via running over a long time with higher instantaneous luminosity and improved detectors. So whatever data we have collected that you can say only a few percent, five to 6% of total data we are expecting from LHC. And for that, we need higher fluxes. And LHC energy will be very slightly higher because as I tried to explain earlier, the LHC machine is uh, physically, it is fixed. So the radius of curvature, all this is fixed. So uh, there will be a little bit of improvement of uh, magnet and the operation of the LHC machine that will increase the energy from the current 13 TV to 14 TV. But what will be mainly the important part is that higher instantaneous luminosity. That means we will get a lot more data. But to withstand the radiation, effect of uh, that high luminosity. The currently detectors which were planned back in 80s and 90s, they will not be uh, sufficient enough. So we have to replace the detector components one by one. So we are uh, busy now doing that. R&D portion is almost finishing and we will be soon uh, starting our detector uh, um, construction where we will replace the current LEC subsystems by those improved detectors. But of course, immediately, this year itself, LHC will start its run three. As I said, run three, you can imagine run one and run two is already over. Run one completed in 20, early 2013, it started in 2009, and run two started in 2015, it went on in 2019. And uh, this uh, date, actually, I'm sorry, I should have uh, changed it. Very recently, this date is also modified. So basically, two more decades. So it's a great opportunity for the younger generation to contribute to the global effort, one of the largest human endeavors. I hope this I have been able to impress upon you. So I uh, conclude by saying a few things in the summary that uh, LEC project is fantastic. In every sense you can think of, I could uh, just uh, discuss a very few points. It is an unbelievable pursuit for the imaginary. That's I believe very much. And that really to be able to consider myself a part of this LEC project, is really very, very much uh, humbling for us that uh, we are uh, taking part in this worldwide effort. Its scientific goals are well defined with far reaching consequences on our fundamental knowledge about the, uh, about the universe. You can say the, uh, as they call it, uh, one step ahead in the understanding of the humankind, the um, understanding of the nature by the humankind. And the discovery of the Higgs boson by the LHC experiments a decade ago, but predicted five decades earlier, it marks the excellent worldwide collaborative effort leading to great success. We are still studying the Higgs uh, physics. It is not yet over, though the 10 years are over, we have to still understand the Higgs particle in a much more detailed way. And the coming years when we have more data will give us uh, more access to many more uh, minute and accurate probably the properties of the Higgs particle we will be able to measure. And all these are interconnected. So we shall be able to understand much more about the universe as well. So next decade, two decades will be intensive with analysis of collected data going in parallel to preparation for future operations of the LHC. So make it your future playground, the students. And I could talk only about the Higgs physics today a little bit, but there are many more interesting physics are happening. For example, uh, that can be 
uh, estimated by the fact that uh, these uh, LHC experiments uh, publish about uh, 80, 85 papers per year. So there are many, many interesting topics. And there are, uh, at a given time, almost uh, 1,000 students doing PhD. So I stop here. Thank you so much. I just leave uh, one uh, slide. Just I have listed some of the applications of the accelerators and the society. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh Professor Kadir Mazumdar for the excellent talk and making it simple. Yes, uh, this experiment has contributed a lot to the community and as well as to the society as many things have come out of it. And uh, I would encourage students to ask questions. Please put your question in the chat box. And Okay, so I should go to the chat box. Can somebody see, shall I unshare to see the chat? Oh, no. okay. uh, there is one question by Gopal Garg. Uh, do uh, need there to is know... Noor Alam also. Okay. Uh, yeah. do, yes. do, do neutrinos interact with Higgs field? If not, then why? Actually, I didn't have a chance to talk about myself about this interaction. Neutrinos do interact, but very, very feebly. That's why their mass is so low. Very feebly. But uh, since it is proved that uh, neutrinos have mass, if the standard model description of the Higgs interaction is correct, that means neutrinos do interact with the Higgs boson field. And of course, the um, top quark interacts maximally. That's why top quark is the most massive particle among all the elementary particles we know today. Uh, Vandana, I'm unable to see Noor's question. Can you? No, Noor can ask the question uh, uh, himself or herself because uh, can unmute. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, ma'am. After a long time, I just uh, say, oh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my question is that is very stupid, maybe. So Higgs, no, no, nothing is stupid. <laughs> so Higgs uh, decays in many uh, mode, right? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, let's say. Uh, uh, Higgs decay to ZZ, then four lepton, then his WW, then yes. uh, uh, others, uh, MU nu, then mu nu, kind of, and gamma gamma. So, is there any search of invisible uh, decay? Yeah. Of, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, yeah. So, the point is, of course, uh, as uh, we were trying to say, that uh, Higgs interaction depends on the type of particle. If you take electromagnetic interaction, the photon interacts equally, uh, uh, means uh, equivalently for photon, electron, and muon, the same because the charges are same. But Higgs depends on the mass. Higgs interaction with particles depend on mass. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we just mentioned a few minutes back, that uh, the mass of the neutrino being very small, so Higgs decaying directly to neutrino pair is extremely small, okay. 10 to the minus 3 or so. But in uh, certain models, you can imagine that Higgs can decay to neutrino-like massive particles. Say, for example, if we consider supersymmetric particles. Mm -hmm. So there is something called uh, uh, neutralino. These are like heavier cousins of neutralino. So neutralinos are supersymmetric particles. They can be as massive as a few hundred uh, GV, let's say. And uh, they are stable particles, but they don't interact uh, much. So in fact, they are called least uh, stable particles. But Higgs, because... If this Higgs mechanism is correct, then they have also got mass due to the Higgs mechanism from the Higgs. It may be a different types of Higgs. Yeah. But we can think of Higgs decaying to these massive particles, these uh, neutralinos, and that will then lead to invisible decay of okay. the Higgs boson. Okay. Now, mind you, we may not be able to de detect all the decays of the Higgs boson due to something or other. So what we do is that we, we try to detect or measure carefully the modes which we know how to detect. Like Higgs decay, as you said, uh, to photon pair, Ws, uh, to um, um, leptons, uh, hadrons, etc. B quarks, top quarks, Z, um, uh, top leptons, Z, etc. And then from there, we can interpret that what is the branching fraction. So there is a, there is a continuous effort to understand this uh, Higgs to invisible particle decay. And the upper limit currently is about, uh, say, for example, 14%. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. Uh, there that is a question from Parmit Gaur. Yeah. 
yeah so uh in the current stunt model we do include the hicks but uh, still like uh, we are treating the uh, neutrinos to be massless so have we made any calculations or any effort to to uh, with the hicks mechanism like we do for all the other particles to see that yes the neutrinos uh, i mean we know currently that neutrinos have mass but do they have we made any efforts to see that they do interact with the hicks the point is in standard model there is a small extension if we make we can include the, the neutrino mass and uh, there is um, various ideas including uh, uh, majorana neutrinos etc dirac neutrinos so from uh, various mathematical ways you can uh, sort of take into fold that how the neutrinos get masses bp6 sorry permit continue uh, the, the, then we call the model uh, that is what we are calling as the uh, beyond standard model that will be bs you can say it is beyond standard model but the extension of standard model what is necessary is very small you don't need to envisage many more particles right most also for example supersymmetry they it envisages a whole host of particles but this extension of a standard model to include the neutrino mass is a uh, non zero neutrino mass is uh, not much and we can do that right thank you uh, bp singh he needs to unmute Please be pacing please and yeah, yeah now now unmuted <laughs> sorry yeah, sorry okay. yeah so so i would like to thank the professor majumdar for very nice talk and uh, i have very i mean this elementary query regarding this no no nothing is elementary i kept it in elementary only i didn't go in oh, yeah the, yeah the, so uh, regarding regarding the superconducting accelerators in the hospital Huh. as far as i know i i don't know whether i have the full of any information or not there is a medical cyclotron at calcutta and is there any other uh, superconducting accelerator possibility in india or is there any future proposal that has been, that has been submitted for having a superconducting accelerator and what will be the advantage of superconducting accelerator for producing the short lived or the short half life nucleus i am uh, sorry that i will not be able to give you the details i am not aware of any other place whether it is already there maybe professor vandana can uh, illuminate if uh, she is aware of but uh, yeah okay yeah so just a short answer the advantage of the superconducting accelerator is it's a compact so if you have the even the high energy proton accelerators if they want then it, they are compact for operating because they consume overall uh, less power the size is compact and so on but uh, that, uh, that, currently yes fine, the calcutta I, I, is the I, I, main special uh, want to talk regarding the short half life short life radio nuclei i mean ah uh, that way, actually uh, is it's is okay that, it's fine yeah. i i understand I mean. yeah. okay yeah. thank yeah. you yeah so there is a, there are a couple of questions at the youtube can i read yeah. them there is still one hand raised थियरी very very far away and uh, the point is uh, okay if you remember the earlier slides for each uh, increase of uh, by uh, power of 10 an effort of uh, 10 to 20 years is needed say for example next um, accelerator which may come up is that uh, future circular collider maybe uh, it will come after 40 50 years lot of r and d is necessary but uh, it will uh, go only by one order of magnitude it's about 100 tv collider so it is not at all easy and in the current way of uh, doing things 
by no chance we, we shall be able to reach that uh, plank scale and mind you there is no experimental uh, prediction rather there is no physical prediction of such theories which is testable okay uh, one more question is uh, what is the size of a neutrino hmm. in uh, quantum mechanics uh, you know that uh, you can call it a wave particle duality etc so if you consider it as a particle you can call it a, it's almost third dimension yes you can say i don't think we can talk about any particular size okay uh, dr kanjilal you have a question uh, i i have a question like about ilc you have not touched do you have touched such vast areas of research yeah uh -huh. but uh, that is that is a much cleaner particle this electron and positron not yes. like proton and electron. yes okay. no i i discussed only about the higgs um, physics little bit only hmm. but uh, i did not uh, go outside the lc experiment yeah, right. of course ilc is being planned but unfortunately globally there is not enough uh, you can say support Mm. for bringing a um, uh, international linear collider which as you said that it is electron positron collider so it will not produce any debris it will have fixed energy so if we run this uh, ilc experiment at say for example 500 gv or so we shall be able to study particular production mode of uh, higgs and their properties very well but it is not clear whether it will come up in japan or any other country will support it yeah, yeah. And uh, today the also there was a twenty-two billion dollars, so it is yeah. very costly. Very costly. Whereas so. this LAC is around six billion. Euro. So that was to start with, of course. Each uh, LAC is going to be costly. Uh, support is not yeah. ensured. Well, support is not forthcoming, forthcoming. Yeah. and that is why but, uh, Japanese yeah, you know, government physics, is not ready. Now, I, I was trying to say physics-wise. It will be sure, sure. sure. His boson will be in plenty when poly we can. Yes, yes, so, yes, um, yes. Uh, your yeah. dark energy, dark mass, and all those things. Uh, but important, dark, hmm, okay. important thing is that this uh, electron and positron is cleaner system. Yes, it is a cleaner system. Uh, mind you, uh, we cannot access dark energy in this type of experiment. Now here is... I we are still LAC starting... Cannot, no, 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 none of these here. Dark matter we can try dark, to find out. Dark but not dark energy. Dark, it will dark matter. Dark so matter. at LHC also we are start, uh, looking heavily, uh, extensively for the dark matter. We have not yet found any evidence. And it will be similar situation for ILC also. We will be continuing to search for dark matter, but not dark energy. It's a completely different uh, situation. Yeah, that is not dark energy. Extreme. And if Japan does not have ILC, maybe in europe uh, maybe some europe, uh, europe may do uh, some electron positron collider but uh, everything is on uh, slow the path. japan has already started developing the site and all those things as you know but uh, yes, funding but is not has, uh, yeah that is the main thing that international community uh, wants japan to be much more uh, and i can quickly committed. make a simple comment anyway you yeah. are an excellent Please. talk and you covered so many things uh, just you. to add it that yeah, India yeah. already producing this uh, in mass. Uh, they are regularly supplying isotopes using hmm. uh, particle accelerator. There are two processes are going on. Uh, Calcutta also. They are uh, using proton beam. But in future, actually, it is being developed at uh, Samir, a high energy 30 MeV electron beam for production of short lived isotope. So that we don't have to import from abroad. The nuclear isotopes for diagnostic purposes. Okay. Mm, that so, is nice. That okay. is, and the hadron therapy already one is installed yes. in um, in uh, Chennai. Another is going to come up. It is sure to come up in uh, TMC in Mumbai. Yes. Because it is sanctioned. Yeah, that is also underway. That got delayed and, uh, because of COVID. Underway, but uh, yeah. my, in principle, yeah. Yeah. this is sanctioned project. Yeah, yeah. COVID delayed it. There is one more question uh, yeah. by Gopal Garg. Is the Higgs mechanism the only possible answer to mass problem? Uh, you can uh, say that uh, yes. You can uh, have a different way of generating masses of uh, particles of different types in uh, physics beyond standard model. So in these scenarios, the 
mathematical structure is a bit more complex than the structure in uh, standard model. So uptight uh, particle quarks will have uh, mass due to one Higgs particle, and the downtype uh, quarks will have mass by interacting with another Higgs particle. But uh, essentially, it is the through the Higgs mechanism only. Okay, thank you. And there are, uh, say, for example, in supersymmetry, there are five types of Higgses, one envisages. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Kaji Mazumdar again for the excellent talk. And uh, uh, really, it was a very good talk. And uh, we at Aligarh would like, uh, would love you to be here sure, and uh, sure. interact with the students and in yeah. future. Uh, Professor yes. B.P. Singh would like to say anything. Thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity to share the excitement. And I mm. hope uh, students from uh, AMU will be able to join the LHC experiments. And uh, yeah, they... definitely if we visit, then we can talk much more directly and uh, take up one topic, discuss much more mm -hmm. in details, et cetera. Yes. Uh, LS group, uh, yes. uh, in the LS group, yeah. AMU yeah. is already there. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But there's no participation in the good. CMS. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you are there from the beginning. I know. So, uh, is it over, Sajjad Sahib? Is it over or uh, we have yes, some more yes, questions? Sir. No, no, there are no more questions. So, I think formally we can uh, thank uh, Professor Majumda for thank her very so nice much. presentation and very nice talk. And it was really informative and uh, she has connected from the very elementary to maybe uh, the particle physics level, uh, which was which was not understood to me I mean, on various points, but it was very informative in this sense. And uh, thank you very much once again. Thank you so much to all. Thank you so much for thank your you. attendance. Thank, thank you, Vandana, for giving thank us the opportunity to host so Professor Kaka. Thank yeah. you for hosting oh, it, really. And I really look yeah. forward to the AMU chapter uh, getting uh, very active again. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Vandana. Thank you, Professor VPC.